financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. I'm Tim Graham of The Athletic, here with Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times, uh, acquired last month by WIVB Channel 4. Uh, but just like uh, I can't go walking around saying that I am a New York Times employee, uh, employees at New Bronstein Times are not allowed uh, to say that they are out there representing Channel 4. Is that correct? I, I, I guess I'm not allowed to come on this podcast and say I'm representing Channel 4, but I can go other places with my WIVB credential. But I do have to clarify that I'm not on television. Sometimes people want to know when it's going to be on TV, and I have to say, oh, never. <laughs> you get uh, that people feel deflated after that. They think they're being interviewed for the television station. Then at the end, they're like, I shouldn't have wasted my time with Jonah Bronstein. Uh, maybe a little bit, but I'm used to that because I had a job with the Buffalo News a few years back where I only wrote for the website and people would ask me when it was going to be in the paper. And when I told them it wasn't, it was like interview over. They just didn't care anymore. Even though they say nobody reads newspapers anymore and everything's online. When you have one of these jobs where it's digital only, people are very, uh, disappointed to find out that they're not in the analog old style media the next morning or the next day. The counter to that is when you're online, it's forever. And yes, uh, there could be a situation where, like with the Buffalo News, every time they redesign their webpage, they seem to lose their archives or anything that was produced under the previous uh, web um, software and such. And it takes a little while to, to bring it back. Um, but when you're online, it's forever. And I guess you're it's forever when you're in the newspaper too, but you don't have to go to the library to look up something that was online. If you're in the Buffalo news, if you were in the Buffalo news in 1997, unless you saved the physical copy of the paper, you're probably going to have to go to the library and dial up some microfilm or something. Yeah. And the stories can be longer or sometimes there's more photos or video or multimedia elements that aren't in the newspaper or with this job. Now it, it you know, there's more detail and more different types of stories that can be told digitally. that can't be told on television. But I think there's something official to having your name in the paper, having your picture in the paper, having a big headline uh, in the newspaper. Even though we have headlines on digital stories, they're not big and bold and don't seem to mean the same thing that a newspaper headline does. Uh, you know, people don't buy 10 copies of the website. They buy 10 copies of the newspaper. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, but you can send the link to grandma. I mean, even my mother at 78 years old, uh, I can send her a link via text, uh, and she'll see my work a lot easier than she would have if she had to either subscribe to the paper or go down to the corner uh, drugstore and pick it up off the rack. Uh, so my, yeah, I think people come around eventually. I think they have to. We learned uh, from our good friend, Mike Rodak, uh, that uh, the papers down there in Alabama, the chain that he works with, they're going to cease publishing the, the physical copy of the newspaper altogether. Some, some newspapers dial it back to, all right, we're only going to publish five days a week. Uh, and on those days that we're not, uh, take a look at our website. I think the Cleveland Plain Dealer does that. The New Orleans Times pick a Yoon, the, the papers in Pittsburgh. Uh, there are a lot of, uh, I'm sorry? Niagara Gazette. Niagara Gazette. But I, I was kind of going more towards like even major newspapers, major market daily, morning daily newspapers are going this way. Whereas in Rodex uh, chain, they're just going to stop printing newspapers altogether. It's going to be entirely online, which is uh, I think it seems radical, but it's not getting that way. I think that's going to become quite commonplace uh, here in the, in the years to come. And I don't mean in the years down the road. I'm saying probably the next two or three years, newspapers, uh, if they can, when it comes to 
union contracts and honoring all kinds of different agreements that you have and infrastructure and logistics, if they can stop worrying about printing presses and truck drivers and uh, all those other things that are required uh, that have an incredibly high overhead to print out a, the physical copy of the paper, newsprint, uh, all that type of stuff that uh, newspapers are going to be walking away um, in, in droves uh, and exponentially so. Anyway, uh, nobody wanted to hear a multimedia rundown. Uh, the Buffalo Bills play the Minnesota Vikings tomorrow. Uh, this is being recorded on November 12th, 2022, year of our Lord, uh, at 4.40 p.m., uh, essentially. Uh, part of the reason Jonah and I uh, waited a little while to do this podcast uh, was because of Josh Allen's injury situation. Most of it was because I was jammed up all week with other things and I couldn't do it, as was Jonah. And uh, so here we are uh, the day before the game. We usually don't do the podcast then. We wanted to breathe. But there was a lot of lingering curiosity, uh, lingering questions regarding Josh Allen and his uh, ulnar ligament. And we learned just within the past half hour or so that the Bills are not elevating Matt Barkley off the practice squad, which means only two quarterbacks on the roster right now, one of whom uh, is Josh Allen. This is final. Uh, this can't be corrected tomorrow uh, before the game. So the, the Bills go into the game against the Vikings with Case Keenum and Josh Allen, the only quarterbacks uh, to dress. What do you think this means? Do you think Josh Allen actually plays, Jonah? Well, yes, I do think he plays. I, I felt that way most of the week. I wouldn't say all along, but I think, um, you know, first of all, there were leaks early in the week that seemed to indicate the injury wasn't very serious and that maybe he would play in the cryptic Stefan Diggs tweet, which may or may not have been about Josh Allen, but it, many interpreted as it being a good sign for Josh Allen's health. And I believe that when they came into the uh, the practice week on Wednesday, you, you got to really read between the lines with all football coaches, especially Sean McDermott and the Bills. But day to day often means that you know they're hopeful he can play, that, that maybe he won't, this player won't play, but that it's still in play. And as the week went on, he got elevated hour to hour. And now I think they're singing the Doobie Brothers song minute by minute because it seems like any minute now we, we could have some confirmation that Josh Allen will try to play. It appears he practiced or I think it's been reported that he did throw the football yesterday. And it seems like maybe he's not 100%. Maybe there's some injury and some pain that he'll have to deal with. But it isn't an injury that requires weeks of rest. And I think if it was a – whether it was a two-week, four-week, one-week injury uh, – over the course of the week, that would have leaked out, I believe. I, I don't think, even though the Bills were trying to keep this close to the vest, that would have somehow, some way, uh, been reported that Josh Allen wasn't playing if he wasn't playing. So I think all week long, it was an option that he could play, and now it looks like he will play. Uh, fortunately, it's not daylight savings weekend, because I think that would help the situation <laughs> that extra hour. Uh, and a little bit of how the sausage gets made, Jonah. I know that there were a lot of people, and I was having some fun with them, uh, particularly people who try to get under my skin on, on social media, uh, regarding news. Uh, everybody was looking for news on Josh Allen on Monday and Tuesday uh, and getting over the getting uh, trying to tee off on the local media regarding our laziness and how come we're not out there shaking the, the, le the, trees off, the leaves off the trees and, and finding out every little bit we can. You need to understand when it comes to major players in the NFL, really, I would say most NFL players, because a vast majority of them belong to a handful of agents or agencies. Uh, and unless you happen to know a small time agent who represents a mid-level player, probably you're not going to get any inside information from a team when it comes to an injury and certainly not a player of Josh Allen's caliber. Those stories are given to three or four different reporters at the national level. Adam Schefter, Ian Rappaport, Chris Mortensen, uh, the late uh, John Clayton, when he was, you know, maybe, you know, 10 years ago when he was still at ESPN, that was in his wheelhouse. Because teams know or agencies know that giving the information to that reporter uh, will help them out in a different way 
somewhere down the line. Uh, it will get out as quickly as possible. Um, Tim Graham or Jay Skursky reporting on Josh Allen's uh, elbow ligament when the Bills and or his agent felt it was time to put that information out there does not go nearly as far as Chris Mortensen doing it, which is what happened on Monday eventually. And that's just the way it is. And it's that way in every market. It's not Buffalo. It's not the fact that it's a small town market. It happens with the Jets. It happens with the Rams. It happens with the Bears. You name the team. Uh, there's a, a personnel per, uh, a personnel executive or an agent who kind of usually has clearance from the team. Hey, I'm going to give this to so-and-so a lot of times. The days of injury scoops are essentially over. And I can recall having my last injury scoop in 2007. Well, I should say a last major injury scoop as it's happening. You can also do injury stuff where you can go back after the fact, like let's say uh, Kyle Aposo's feature that I did. There was a mystery for 18 months as to what really happened to Kyle Aposo. And eventually he was ready to talk about it. And he um, decided he was going to talk with me about it. 18 months is a long time. There's a lot of context involved. He's healed. But in the heat of the moment, when you're looking for an injury update because you don't know what to do with your fantasy team or how to bet the game or whether or not this 11-point spread is too high when it comes out on uh, last Sunday night, those injury updates come through very tight and restricted channels. So the last big injury update I got um, was probably Ricky Williams in 2007. He had come off of a suspension from marijuana usage. He was back. It was his first game. The game took place in uh, uh, at Heinz Field in Pittsburgh, and he got stepped on on his shoulder, uh, and it tore his labrum. And I returned to South Florida the next day after that game, and I contacted his agent, and his agent happened to tell me. It, it was um, Lee Steinberg. And it was probably my first conversation ever with Lee Steinberg, but he was that accessible and nobody else bothered to call him. So I called Lee Steinberg. I said, I'm Tim Graham with the Palm Beach Post. I wanted to see if there's an update on Ricky Williams injury. And he told me that doesn't happen anymore. And it's because with 24 hour sports programming and all these shows, you know, the NFL uh, receives a lot of money from ESPN, the NFL Network, Fox Sports, you know, Jay Glazer. He's another one who's almost always right. I don't know that he's ever that I've ever noticed him be wrong. Occasionally, you'll see Ian Rappaport or Adam Schefter be wrong on something. Jay Glazer's bats a thousand. He's another one. Um, but these networks pay the NFL so much money that they expect this stuff in return. And it's kind of baked into the casserole of our coverage of you that these things are going to come through us and through our insiders. So anyway, that's my long that's my little uh, sports journalism 101 discussion that I give my students at Canisius uh, every spring, uh, explaining how these things happen sometimes. The day of the old shoe leather reporting, where I would uh, start shaking down Josh Allen's family members or knocking on this front door of his, his place and wherever he lives in Hamburg or Orchard Park or uh, down on the, on the lake. I don't know. Where, I actually don't know where that Josh Allen lives, but. I mean, like, hey, man, can I get a scoop? Those days are way over. So here we are still trying to figure out what's going to happen 20 hours before kickoff. And uh, how hurt is Josh Allen, really? Yeah, although I would say you should maybe tell your Kenesha students, you can still do that covering college, amateur, high school, and even some of the lesser oh, leagues, especially right. the NHL, where there are a lot more uh they hide the injury information or the body parts and things like that. There is still opportunities to uh, report on details of injuries, maybe not so much with the NFL. And I think a lot of that has to do with the gambling and the fantasy implications and the rules that NFL teams try to get around a little bit, but there's structures in place to prevent uh, misinformation out there about injuries because the NFL wants accurate injury information put out there for the gamblers and the fantasy players and the fans in general. And you can't really lie or hide too much about an injury uh, in certain situations, especially midweek and later towards the week and on an official injury report. What I do think with Josh Allen is, uh, you know, cause will he play or won't he play? We'll find that out Sunday when they take the field. I think a more interesting conversation is 
whether he should play, whether the Bills should be more cautious with this injury. If is it really worth him playing through an injury in midseason? Because you are, you need him to be as healthy as possible for that wild card playoff game in Miami, and you don't want him to get hurt now and not well, be able to play. What about this possibility, though, Jonah, where they didn't elevate Matt Barkley? Josh Allen is still 50-50, and maybe he doesn't play. He backs up, and he's healthy enough. Like, if it is 50-50, all right, if we need you to go in there and take some snaps, fine. Um, but, Case, you're playing in this game. And unless something really bad happens, then, Josh, you're going to watch this one and get ready for Cleveland uh, and keep healing. Yeah, And also the strategic effect of maybe you elevate Mac Bartley to make Minnesota think that Josh Allen's not playing, then Josh Allen does play the game. That's a move that could be done that wouldn't violate any injury disclosure rules that the Bills maybe could have pulled that little fast one had they wanted to. But the Bills are in a position now with a number of players on the active roster, not on injured reserve, that are injured and not going to play. Jordan Poyer is ruled out. Kair Elam's ruled out. Greg Rousseau is ruled out. Tredavious White is not ruled out, but I don't think he's going to play. And the practice squad elevation that the Bills did today with Xavier Rhodes seems to indicate a possibility that Tredavious White won't play, even though maybe he does. Maybe that was more of a Kair Elam replacement elevation. But the Bills, you can only have so many roster spots devoted to injured players that are not on injured reserve. And I think the Bills were in a situation where maybe they couldn't do that with Josh Allen. And if Josh Allen is healthy enough to go out there and play with a somewhat sprained elbow or with a sprained elbow, and Josh Allen wants to play hurt, that seems to be uh, part of the recipe here, then I think the Bills are going out there and putting him out there and hoping that nothing bad happens from him playing with a sprained elbow. Regarding Tredavious White, I could see it as a situation as giving him some limited time out there. Uh, maybe certain situations put him out there so he can get a feel for game time speed and that type of thing as a way to continue to ramp him back towards being full go. Um, somebody to, I work with that. I'm oh, sorry, but no, somebody I, I work I, with WIVB suggests they should do that with Josh Allen, that he should be on a pitch count and maybe a bullpen game that he should play quarterback the whole game. I, I don't have a problem with that theory with the exception of you have a bunch of guys running at you and trying to tackle you. So in baseball, yeah, you can make sure you only throw fastballs and let's not put too much torque and maybe only the occasional curveball. But even if you have your pitch count, it's not just about the, uh, the strain on the elbow from throwing the ball. You might take a helmet in the wrong place. Uh, it may be running the ball as he tucks it. You know, you got to tuck the ball away. He, and he's going to fit. His, his uh, natural response is to stiff arm and lower shoulder. So if he's even using his left hand to do that type of stuff, he's got to tuck the ball away in exactly the place where the injury is. Um, and so that's if there's any kind of tenderness there or he's not able to have ball security. Um, so there's all kinds of things that can happen with the, this ligament that have nothing to do with throwing the football um, that I think that a pitch count would – clearly help because you have, he's going to be down, uh, not as many snaps. And if he's only out there for 70% of the snaps, then that's 30% chance improvement of not re-injuring it, I guess. But anyways, um, what about the possibility that, you know, so it does appear Josh Allen is healthy enough to play, but is there a limitation on his elbow on his throwing arm that makes him less of a quarterback, less of a passer, less of a strong arm passer, timing, rhythm, confidence, and his ability to make some of those unbelievable throws could really change how he plays the game and the fortunes of the Bills offense, even if he's still able to go out there and play all the stuff. Absolutely. And, and sports medicine people that I talk to, and of course, everybody is different, but what that ligament does, it's tied to your fingers and including your thumb uh, and where it becomes really um, from a practical standpoint, significant is gripping the football. Regardless of how big your hands are or any of that type of stuff, or how, you know that ligament uh, is is going to be huge on ball security. So there's that part of it. Um, so yeah, if he can't grip it as well as he's used to, um, and can he throw it as far as he wants? And of course, we take a look at that 
uh, that pinpoint bomb that traveled 70 yards in the air to Gabe Davis and, and hit Gabe Davis right in the numbers and he couldn't come down with it. Uh, that was two plays after uh, the injury occurred. You would look at that and say, oh, well, there's no, nothing to worry about. Um, but we also don't know what's happened in terms of swelling and after the fact and the adrenaline's not there like it was. He was incredibly loose. This was at the end of the game, all that type of stuff. What happens uh, two hours after the game or the next morning or when he tries to do it again? Uh, the other thing that my sports medicine people tell me is that the brace that is worn for this uh, to, to keep your ulnar ligament from further stretching or fraying or anything like that or getting damaged by additional contact, the brace that prevents that part of the uh, elbow from going back too far um, does not restrict your throwing motion. And so this sleeve slash brace that he can wear um, should not restrict him from that standpoint, at least in terms of the mechanics aspect of it. But where it comes down to it, again, is in gripping the football. And again, the other things I said, like running the ball, which is a little more incidental, uh, but with the way he plays and the way a lot of these, a lot of athletes do, um, their brain is hardwired to do certain things in, in certain instances when you can't think about it. Um, his instinct is to stiff arm. His instinct is to hurdle and lower a shoulder and do all that stuff. So you can say, oh, well, just slide or just stay in the pocket. That's easy to say. Um, that's easy for the boxing trainer to say in the three months leading up to the fight, and you work on it every day, every day, every day, how you're going to uh, slip this punch and counter with the uppercut, or you're going to stay away, or you're going to move to your left the entire fight. You're going to move to your left. And then all of a sudden that bell rings and the guy is like, well, I'm moving to my right and I'm going to, I'm going to throw, throw the first punch and do it up because that's unfortunately for, for coaches how a lot of high level athletes, well, it's human beings, it's, you don't even have to be a high level athlete. D dumb athletes do this too. Uh, they just, there's an instinct and the instinct makes them who they are. And they end up relying way more on their instinct than what any coach has told them or drilled into them or begged them to do. Um, that's why we see here in uh, 2022, Josh Allen still not sliding after his coaches have been begging him to do it since he entered the NFL, he still doesn't do it. And that's just because that's how his brain's wired. So that's and the maybe, thing that I think maybe you need to protect Josh Allen from himself when to your point, Jonah, of maybe they shouldn't let him play this week. Right. I, I agree. And I also think maybe from a psychological mentality standpoint, you know, if we're talking about thumb and grip and, and things down the arm, maybe that affects touch passes more than it affects the full body throws down the field. And, and he's already been struggling for about six quarters now. Uh, throw two interceptions in each of the past two games. He's still a great quarterback, but is he a little bit out of his uh, rhythm and timing and playing to his best potential? And if there's something missing in the way he's able to place the ball perfectly, uh, I just wonder if there's a situation where he goes out there and he plays poorly or they lose the game or there's a few plays, a few throws that you want back, as they like to say, and the Bills look at it or the people, the fans and the media look at it as you really should have held Josh Allen out of this game or held him out for a week or two to get him 100% right, maybe to sit and regroup after playing poorly last week and get back on. Uh, you know, he was the MVP favorite and he might still be the MVP favorite. But I think a lot of Bills fans were afraid of the disaster scenario where Josh Allen misses an extended period of time and the Bills lose a lot of games without him and they fall in the playoff picture and they're not the best team in the AFC any longer. But there's another way this derails the season and that Josh Allen isn't, you know, Josh F and Allen anymore, or at least for a couple of weeks. And that could change the trajectory of the season. We've seen it with other quarterbacks and other prominent star players in a lot of other sports that when you're not 100 percent physically, it changes your game. It changes your belief and confidence and ability to do certain things instinctually, as you've explained. And that in the NFL, the margin for error is so slim that you can go from being the best player in the league to, you know, an also ran quarterback with just a little bit of weakness in your throwing arm. Well, again, I am using another boxing uh, analogy and I'm not comparing Josh Allen to Muhammad Ali, but yeah, you're used to your body being able to do certain things. And then all of a sudden they can't anymore. 
And then you see what happens to guys like Muhammad Ali and Roy Jones Jr. later in their careers. Oh, I can, I see the punch coming, but I can't get out of the way. Uh, I see the receiver open, but I can't get it there. Uh, shit. Or I'm thinking about it one half second longer than I should because I'm trying to be incredibly perfect with this throw because I know my, you know, my, I, I got my, my ligaments barking at me in my elbow. And so I'm going to, make sure I throw the perfect pass and that gives the linebacker that extra half second to close the gap and pick it off. So yeah, that that's clearly a concern. Anytime you're dealing with an injury to uh, directly to an athlete's main weapon, which is Josh Allen's right arm. Um, Jonah, I want to talk about the Sabres. Uh, you've uh, been at the games uh, this week and a couple of interesting things happening. Tuesday night's loss to the Phoenix Coyotes, the election night loss was ugly uh, and included a broken down Zamboni. Um, Metaphorical, symbolic there for the Sabres to have the Zamboni break down right there on the ice against a team they were supposed to beat? Uh, Perhaps, and that's a pretty cliche lead that some of us may or may not have written on Tuesday night about how that game (laughs) went. Actually finding out not long after that game that the Zamboni was fixed before the end of the third period kind of flies in the face of that metaphor because the Sabres didn't really fix anything in that third period or even in the game against Vegas on Thursday. They're really struggling. They've lost four in a row, and they're playing the Boston Bruins tonight, which is uh, the best team in the Eastern Conference and between Boston and Vegas, the two hottest teams in the league. And I don't know if this is a panic button situation yet for the Sabres, but a lot of the good vibes from earlier in the season and the carried over from last season are over with now. And this team's, you know, chasing it quite a bit. And, you know, it's not as fun of a team to watch and follow and root for as I think it was just a week or two ago. Well, because the the wins aren't coming, but to me, I still see mostly the same team uh, out there. They're still scoring goals. Um, the goaltending obviously has been really bad, um, but they're, they're scoring goals. They still seem to have the same energy. Uh, the, the top players are still doing top things. Tage Thompson, uh, seems to be able to score a goal whenever he wants, which is pretty uh, cool. So yeah, there's a lot of similarities to the team that we're seeing this week versus two weeks ago. Um, and maybe we got a little too excited or, and I'm not saying we, but maybe I should say Sabres fans, a little too excited. This is probably the team that they're supposed to be this year, uh, a mixed bag, uh, good, good streaks versus, you know, some dealing with some speed bumps. Um, yeah. And it's a long season. And aside from that Arizona Coyotes game, which is a bad loss, these other losses have come against good teams. And if we're assuming maybe they lose again against Boston, uh, the road trip last week, Florida or Carolina and Tampa Bay, Vegas and Boston, those are four of the very best teams in the NHL. So the Sabres maybe aren't supposed to win too many of those games. And you're right, they are scoring goals, even in these losses. They're still, I think, second in the league in scoring behind Boston, who's maybe first in the league. But you're seeing some of the weaknesses in this team and the the ceiling and the limitations and that they're not the most physical team, that they don't really have the leadership and the the gritty sandy players that uh, you need to win these games and and to slow down other good teams and to pull out tight games in the third period. And the goaltending, which Eric Comrie was playing very well early in the season, and that seemed like a place where the Sabres got better, that they had two reliable goaltenders. And now it's looking like, you know, they're pretty good when Craig Anderson's in the net, but they don't want to play Craig Anderson too often. So they're playing a goalie who's struggling and maybe needs to sit down and watch uh, a little bit more often but they're using him most nights and that's where they're struggling is keeping other teams from scoring and keeping other teams from scoring important goals in the third period when they need to uh, batten down the hatches on defense and keep the puck out of their own net. Have you ever had a hatch that needed battened? You know, so I heard that phrase when I was watching a wrestling show the other day and I was thinking, I don't know what batten means and I don't know what the hatches are. And I definitely don't know what batten down the hatches is supposed to mean, but well, I a hatch know would be a, a, phrase a lid, you know, like when you get inside a tank or your cellar doors and you have some uh, people who have those basements in which you can go in through the door, you know, you go down and, or so you even see them in, in, uh, in the city a lot, uh, old bars, you know, where they have the, 
the you know the the ladder that'll take you down into their storage, you know, where they keep their uh, their cases and all that stuff. You got a hatch. You got to go down underneath the hatch, and then you clamp it down. All right. Do so you well, think we should change the saying to clamp down the hatch or close the lid? No, 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 I don't think we should change anything because I do understand what the phrase batten down the hatches means, but I don't know quite literally what it refers to in the, the linguistic origins of where batten down the hatches originated from, what it meant before it came to mean what it means now. Well, maybe it's a sailing thing. Now I'm looking it up batten down the other thing about that though is sometimes people will tell to you tie close like or cover something in order to prevent it from moving or becoming damaged so a hatch would be the similar to what i'm saying a hatch which is you know the, you've come to but a bat you can batten down anything uh, it doesn't have to be uh you know it could be uh when the when the blues brothers go to the county assessor's office and they throw the cigarette machines in front of the uh the doors to keep the SWAT from uh, chasing them up the up the elevator. That would be battening down the the front door at the Chicago City Hall. What do you think about if you have a sprain of your ulnar collateral ligament? Does that make it more difficult to batten down hatches? Probably, uh, depending on the motion that is required for the battening. Um, battening down the hatch Thursday night did not happen. Uh, Jack Eichel was not battened. Uh, hat trick and an assist Vegas golden Knights win seven to four in Buffalo, uh, a hero, uh, one time in Buffalo. Now, maybe the biggest villain, especially does he take over for Tom Brady in Buffalo? Now that Tom Brady is out of the AFC East and nearing the end of his career is Jack Eichel, the new heel. I mean, maybe it sure seemed that way with the way he got booed and some of the Jack, you suck chance and the vitriol that was directed his way. I don't think it should be that way. I think it was understandable last year in his first time back why Sabres fans were, you know, energized and motivated to, to boo him every time he touched the puck. And also this was a season last year where there were very few things to get excited about. And that was a bit of an event. Jack Eichel's first game back in Buffalo after the trade. Now Jack Eichel's second game back in Buffalo after the trade. I did not think should have been as big of a fan moment, but it became that way because of what Jack Eichel said after the game, which I thought was perfectly fair and perfectly fine and an honest, genuine reaction. And I really don't blame him for anything he said after that game last year, but the way it came across and the, you know, the feelings that had arise in Sabres fans, you know, we were to expect. Jack Eichel said he knew what to expect on Thursday night and everybody else in that building knew what to expect. I thought he got booed even harder this time than he did a year ago. And, but again, and his, and his teammates seemed to be egging him on too. I, from everything I heard at the, you know, the coming out for warmups and, you know, the booing, they, they seem to be enjoying it too and, and pushing him a little bit about it. Yeah, they embraced it. That was the big difference, that last year Jack Eichel was surprised by the booing and that it affected his emotional state and the way he played and maybe even the fortunes of the Vegas Golden Knights in that game. This time they fed off the booing. Uh, the whole team, which they're playing great coming into the game, but the whole team seemed fired up to win this game for Jack Eichel. They almost had the game won before Jack Eichel even got on the score sheet. It was 3-2 to two when Jack Eichel insisted on a goal that made it four to two, it was seeming to be a situation where Vegas was going to win the game and it wasn't because of Jack Eichel. And then all of a sudden Jack Eichel, who didn't have this kind of scoring spree type game very often when he played for the Sabres, he got that one assist and he knocked in a rebound and really got it rolling. He had a real nice looking goal for a second goal and then threw one in an empty net that I don't remember too many times where he seemed to have that um, passion and urge to score on the open, on the empty net late in games when he played. That was not a cheap empty net goal either. But it was definitely an empty net goal that he was trying to get for the hat trick for the moment. Uh, you know, not that the game was decided. It didn't need to, they didn't need that goal for the win. They didn't need that goal for the goal differential and the team success. They needed that goal for Jack Eichel and for the few Vegas fans in the stands to throw their golden hats on the ice and for Jack Eichel to walk out the hero of the game. And I thought it was great from the storyline perspective for Jack Eichel, 
for the few people who are, you know, friendly and family members of Jack Eichel that still live in Buffalo, it was a great continuation of that story. Last year was like an episode of a television show or maybe a, a movie that ended a certain way. And now we came back with a sequel that ends a different way. And I'm looking forward to when he comes in next year and how this story evolves. I do think there's a point in time when Jack Eichel gets cheered in Buffalo. And maybe there's a point in time when Jack Eichel's a free agent and Sabres fans are kind of, you know, they have their Mia culpas and want Jack Eichel to be welcomed back in Buffalo. I think that somewhere down the line that happens, but we're certainly not there yet. Well, I spent some time with uh, Dominic Hasek yesterday uh, for a story that'll uh, run in the athletic uh, down the road. And uh, I was talking to him about that because his first games back, well, I think all of his games back with another team, whether it was the Red Wings or the Ottawa Senators, uh, they booed the hell out of him. And here was a guy who won six Vezinas and however many heart trophies and was clearly the uh, the greatest goaltender in franchise history. And if you want to have a discussion, maybe the greatest player uh, in franchise history over uh, Gilbert Perrault. Uh, and yes, of course he is loved now and uh, people line up for his autograph and they've named their children after him and all those types of things. But in that window, uh, when he was wearing a different Jersey, uh, they booed the piss out of him. Uh, now Jack Eichel did not produce nearly as much as uh, well, clearly. Uh, it's an understatement. Uh, Hashik got the team to the 99 Stanley Cup finals and playoff runs and all these great moments. And Jack Eichel never tasted the playoffs, let alone in a, a major award. So uh, maybe a little bit of a, a steeper hill to climb for Jack uh, to get back into the good graces. But I think eventually uh, with context and time, people look back and not hold it against Jack Eichel that he wanted to have a surgery that was best for him. Uh, and right. maybe, and maybe in even a year or two, people are saying, I can't believe Kevin Adams was ever our general manager, uh, and all that type of stuff. I mean, right now, everybody's feeling kind of good about it, uh, with the Sabres and where they are and Alex Tuck and whatever the else the Sabres got in, um, uh, Peyton Krebs, uh, uh, in return for Jack Eichel. But if, you know, it's anyways, I'm rambling a little bit. I, I want to, uh, oh, go ahead. Well, I, I, well, I was curious what your thoughts were on, you know, the Sabres fan reaction and all the booing, it, it, because as you mentioned, Jack, before Jack Eichel got traded, there was a real split among the fan base on whether the Sabres were the bad guys here or whether it was Jack Eichel. And a lot of people were fed up with Jack Eichel and his attitude and could recognize that he probably wanted to be traded and quit on this team long before that neck injury situation. But there was also a lot of people that thought the Sabres mistreated Jack Eichel and didn't allow him to get the surgery that he wanted. And, you know, we're sympathetic to Jack Eichel. And there was definitely a split electorate, if you will, when Jack Eichel was still on the Sabres. Now that he's gone, it seems pretty, you know, unanimous that Sabres fans dislike Jack Eichel, that he's the biggest villain in Buffalo or whatever you want to call him. Or that's just the louder segment of the fan base. And those that are more sympathetic to Jack Eichel and don't want to boo him are very quiet. But I think it's kind of a, petty emotional response. I mean, there's four or 5,000 fans that don't show up to other games, but do show up to boo Jack Eichel. And well, what about this, Jonah? Up. You, and we see it with the, we see examples of this, the player who got traded and gets booed, the guy didn't ask to leave in any sport, you know, whatever it's going to be, the team trades him away and he comes back and the fans jump his shit. <laughs> He's like, I right. got traded. I didn't leave on purpose. I didn't demand to get out. What the hell? Yeah, he didn't leave as a free agent. He didn't demand to get traded in ways that Dominic Hasek and other players have done in their past. And in a way, he did want to be traded, and he did uh, make himself, from the Sabres fan perspective, more of an unlikable player on the way out. So I don't really discount the fact that a lot of Sabres fans were fed up with Jack Eichel by the time. you know, It was obvious that he needed to be traded for the sake of his career and for the Sabres to move on. But just the the level of passion that, you know, they're booing Jack Idol a lot louder than they're cheering for the Sabres. And that seems to be, to me, just, I guess it's just maybe as a media person that's not as emotionally invested in the situation. It just seems weird to me. Sure. And especially when it, it was, it, a break, it was a breakup that's good for both parties. So maybe cheer for Jack Eichel because he's found a better situation in his life. And the Sabres seem to be somewhat better off than they were with Jack Eichel on the roster. It could be a conditioned response to um, the, yeah, 
Sabres fans haven't completely embraced the idea that their team is relevant again because they've spent the last 10 years or however many years looking for other reasons to get excited. You know, uh, Jeremy White at WGR doing the whole group howl thing for, you know, so Phoenix would beat them. Uh, <laughs> they were rooting to lose uh, to mm -hmm. get Jack Eichel. And there's other things along the way. You just look for reasons, like much like the Bills during their playoff drought. We're not here for the game. We're here to get drunk in the parking lot, have fun. I'm going to see my buddy, not even get drunk. I'm here to party before the game. I'm going to hang out with my buddies. I have a ticket. I might not even go into the stadium, but I'm here in the parking lot. We built the fire. We're going to, we're going to have some, uh, some pork roasts and uh, we're going to grill. We're going to have a few beers. Maybe we won't watch the game on TV or maybe I'll go to big tree Inn and I'll watch it there and just not even walk into the stadium. I mean, there's all that, or I don't have a ticket I'm going to go down. I'm going to hang and then I'm going to go somewhere else, you know, all that type of thing. You just look for other reasons to enjoy the game. And I think that that's kind of been built into Sabres fans uh, for so long that that's kind of the conditioned response is to just do that. Find You're looking for alternative reasons to find this game relevant rather than just enjoying the game for what it is. And you can do that on other nights, but at least while Jack Eichel's here, let's take the opportunity and and make him make a make him realize how much we hate him. Certainly, I mean it was an event to boo Jack Eichel more than it was to watch a hockey game. I rode up on the elevator, which was the alternative elevator because the main elevator is broken, with somebody who works somewhere in the building, and he was wearing a suit, and he seemed like a more reasoned person that you know wasn't there to boo Jack Eichel, and maybe even would say, "Oh, I love Jack," and I, and I would never boo him. And I said, "Are you going to boo?" And he said, "Oh, hell yeah, I'm going to boo." <laughs> it was just, it was the thing to do for most everybody that was there. Yeah. Jumping through table. It's the thing to do. You know, now you don't have to as much. We're not, we're not hearing about jumping through tables as much as we used to. Now that the bills are good. It's funny how that works. Uh, Jonah, uh, I know that uh, you uh, were at the UB basketball game today and you are headed out to Canisius basketball here as soon as we stop recording. Uh, I know it's college basketball season, and maybe we'll save the in-depth preview uh, for the big four teams uh, for a future uh, episode. And people are still concentrating on Bills and concentrating on the Sabres, and it's we're still in the early stages of basketball where people aren't getting into it. But quickly, I guess, um, what are your just your general thoughts on each team's chances to compete in their conference? Well. First of all, with the way it is with college basketball, especially at the mid-major level and, and particularly with these local teams, it's very difficult to have any opinion because the rosters are so new. We're still spending time getting to know who these players are, how good they are, how well they fit together. It, it, you know, I don't know as much about any of these teams as I normally would coming into the season or a week into the season. As far as preseason polls and, and looking at, the transfers where they came from and the talent level and projecting not very many of them, not very many of the local teams are expected to do well. The Niagara women, which happen to be the team that retains the most number of players from the previous season are probably the best local team. They could be a top three team in the Mac, although their ceiling might be being the third best team in the Mac and everybody else is predicted either in the middle or the bottom of the conference. And I don't have a lot of confidence that any of them will be that much better the only thing I think, and, and I'll get a look at St. Bonaventure tonight at Canisius, they're picked 10th in the Atlantic 10. Joe Lunardi's uh, initial bracketology rankings has them as the eighth best team in the Atlantic 10. I think that with some of the transfers they brought in, our older senior players, and the way Mark Schmidt coaches and the competitiveness of that program, that I think he'll coach them up to be better than a bottom Atlantic 10 team. But I don't think they can get to the top of the league. So I don't expect any of the local teams to win the conference and go to the NCAA tournament, I'd be pretty surprised. At least the division one teams, I think the Damon teams can do pretty well, but we'll see. I mean, there's so much unknown about the new players and the new rosters and how they fit together and not just the local teams, but the other teams in the conference. But UB did not look good today. Canisius did not look good when I saw them on uh, Monday night. Niagara lost at Maryland and I, I don't know how good they're going to be. So there isn't a lot to be excited about. The UB women are going to be worse than they've been in a very long time with a complete rebuild under the new coach, Becky Burke. So if you're looking for a local team to root for at the Division One level, there's the Niagara women, maybe the Bonham men, and that's about it. All right. Well, Jonah, but get I, out there to the Kessler Athletic Center. 
I will say one thing, though, because I went to UB today, not so much focused on UB, but to Kyle Molson, a local Buffalo kid who played two years at Canisius, then two years at Seton Hall. Now he's in his second year, James Madison, coming off an ACL injury. He's playing well. So there are local college basketball-related stories and teams to maybe get behind and root for. Don Welch is down there at Alabama with Nate Oates and Brian Hodgson. So, you know, if you're a college basketball fan and you're a local college basketball fan, there, there might be things to get excited about this season even if it's not one of the big four teams winning the turn, winning the league and going to the tournament. Okay, Jonah, you better hurry up uh, if you want to find a good parking spot at uh, the KAC. Did you get that email about restricted parking? No, I didn't, but I just assuming because parking is generally not good anyway, and they're playing Bonaventure. So. Yep. And all those Bonaventure fans and their horse and buggies, it's going to be tight. <laughs> Jonah, thanks. Uh, See you out uh, at Highmark Stadium tomorrow. And uh, thank you to everyone out there for listening to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK, CPAs, and business consultants. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara communities through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2022 to help keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400 and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. We'll